everything you can to become more thoughtful, more loving, more appreciative, more helpful of other people, and more forgiving. And, and don't be negative. My name is Stuart Boot Gordon, a World War II fighter pilot, and uh, I, you're visiting my house here in Silverthorne, Colorado. This house I'm living in, which I call Insculptic, which is a combination of word environmental sculpture, and the locals call it the Foam Dome. There's something like seven bedrooms in this house, and then I have two cabins. You made me want to know why, why I built this house like it is. See, there's something like 15 domes on 15 levels, and it's all curved, it's all freeform, it's all, it's all, nothing is square, boxy. For years and years I was a carpenter, and we built a lot of boxes, but uh, I kept thinking about we should build houses that are curved, because for thousands of years we lived in caves and tents and huts that were curved, of course, and the first nine months of our life was not in a box, of course. And so, and then when we were kids, my older brother had a, had a friend, and the three of us would build these igloos. And what we would do is we, we'd put a guy inside, usually me, and I would be in the inside, and they would be, go ahead and build these walls of these round, snow blocks, and I would shink the sides, shink the insides. And then finally, when they finally made the complete dome, they would cut a door in, and they want to come in and see their, you know, where I was. So I was the inside guy. And then we would, it was very easy to build, you know, three of us to build these, these little igloos. I'm building a house on the tennis court and I got the idea about three years ago. This new house, the Blue Chateau, will be partly blue and white, but it'll be on the Blue River. See, right next to me here is the Blue River. And so it'll have just one bedroom, maybe an extra bedroom for a caretaker if I ever get old enough, you know, that I need a care. So I thought I'd build this little house out here so people could really see what it was like to build a small house that anybody could build very quickly, very inexpensively, and 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 be beautiful. It's just made out of domes, and I can write, I can in fact actually written up how to build one of these houses, and it's really really very simple. Uh, and and the dome, of course, you know, is very very strong, and uh, the boxes we have uh, are not are not as strong as, as domes. In fact, you ever take an egg and put it between your hands like this, and then you put the egg in there and you try to break it? it and here this little egg is, is, is extremely thin, and, and yet you can't do it. And by the way, uh, once we built this house, this little house on my tennis court, we're going to turn into a school. It's going to be called the Bauhaus II School of Design. Now, the Bauhaus I started in Germany after World War I by a man by the name of Walter Gropius. Now, Walter Gropius was an architect, and he uh, ended up being a head of the School of Architecture at Harvard. After World War I, he fought in World War I. And it was horrible, you know, as you probably know, in the tr life in the trenches. And he just barely survived. But when he got through, he wanted things to be simple. And so that was his architecture of making things very simple and, and uh, form follow function. In other words, the beauty followed what was supposed to be done and not supposed to have a lot of intricate little th uh, fancy things. Architecture since World War I has been following Walter Gropius's idea of simplicity. And all the architecture of the world has either been influenced, or well, has been influenced, or by the teachers who work there. And so I wrote him a letter and I, when he was at Harvard, and I said, uh, Mr. Gropius, we, it's all wrong. Nothing in nature is boxy and square and angular. It's all smooth and curvy, like a good woman. A woman's body is curved. It's not a boxy. And he wrote back, and I got a copy of his letter, and he said, your ideas are sound, and I hope that you'll be old enough that your ideas will come to fruition. It was just kind of neat, see? 
And so I started building this idea of, well, maybe we should not only build one house, we should have people living in a cluster. Well, everybody in the cluster get together maybe once a week and have a dinner, and they all cook, eat in this big dining room, and they have a nice big kitchen, and they have a library, and maybe have a hot tub, a craft room so they can wax their skis or build bird houses, and then be a little volleyball court and, and, and so forth. And so everybody can share those things, and it could be much more inexpensive and, and, and instead of you know buying everything yourself and, and create a sense of community see and then I remembered in why well, I was a fighter pilot in World War II we all ate the same food we were the same cook cooked our food as it did the enlisted man and we we all shared and and we all did our job of trying to win the war and, and, and so we could go home and anyway so uh, this idea of sense of community is, is really, really important. And the cities that are we built are, do not do that. They seem to separate us. The cars separate us. You know, just one person in the car driving along. So my idea is to start building a, a village, not only a little cluster, but maybe a village of clusters. And then uh, we could have maybe a, a new way of trying to eliminate the automobile because I, I lived for a while or visited three or four times. I visited a Zermatt over in Switzerland, no cars. And it's in the shadow of the Matterhorn. It's beautiful, the Bavarian village with no cars. And people were walking along and used, in the winter there were sleighs, in the summer there, there were horseback. Uh, or horse horse driven uh, you know carriages, but uh, it was the idea of walking together and being with people and chatting and, and sitting and having having a, maybe a beer or a beer or, or a glass of wine with with somebody you didn't know, but it was you get to know them and a sense of sense of, of community. I have a degree in, in education, a master's degree in education. I taught school for many years, and I, I loved it. The idea of turning kids on to, to English or history or, or the world himself was, was fun for me. And so uh, in education is important, and, and, and transportation and architecture, and of course the way you build your cities that encourage the sense of community, see? And, and so it was important. So people said, Boot, how are you going to pay for your monorail? How are you going to pay for your civic center? How are you going to pay for your parks and all this? How are you going to pay for all that? So uh, I created a new economic system, which I called community capitalism. Well, people thought that that was communism, see? It sounded like communism. So I changed the name, and it's called Synergy Capitalism. The idea of getting synergy of the people to create businesses and create corporations and become entrepreneurs. Now, we all can't be entrepreneurs. And, you know, it really takes a, a special person because as an entrepreneur, you have to have an idea and you have to be able to sell your idea. you be a salesman. And the average guy can't sell anything. He can't even talk his girlfriend going to bed when he wants to. So how is he going to sell <laughs> his darn product, for God's sake? Anyway, and he can't. He has to manage the business. He can't manage his own kids. How can he manage the business? See, and 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 so and then all he has to raise money. The average guy can't raise any money, and he can't. And he has any clout. He can't even fix a little parking ticket He's in his own hometown. See, he has no clout. And so, but see, in the town has a tremendous amount of clout. It has people. It can raise funds with municipal bonds. It can and, and it can. It has people there who are, can run things and who are salesmen and you know how to PR thing and, and promote things. So you get them all together. See, and what you do is you create these businesses. And the most important thing is, is that everything in this little village that you build is all owned by the people in the village, not by Wall Street, not by rich Texans, see? And what you, what you do is the, you buy up the, all the land and it's all owned by these people, see? Now, as you build a village, it's fairly inexpensive. But when you build a village, you build these, and it becomes a multi-billion dollar business. 
But you know what usually happens? The speculators come in, see, and they grab the land, and they grab the buildings, and then they sit there and wait, and the prices go up. And this little guy upstairs, one of my renters, told me about Mondragon, M-O-N, D-R-A-G-O-N, Mondragon, Mondragon. It's a workers' co-op in Spain. It's about this little priest, and he um, had his little church, but he noticed they didn't have any school for the kids. Just the rich kids would go to high school. So he started a little school for in, in, his, in his basement for these kids, and then, of course, when they graduated, there was no work. Today, Mondragon is a multi-billion dollar corporation. And it's really interesting how he did it. And he, of course, uh, he, he said that the highest person who runs the corporation cannot make more than five times the, swoop, the, little, guy, the little woman sweeping the store, sweeping the floor at night, see? Well, then now it's gotten to about seven, maybe. So you can't make more than seven times the lowest wage. And they say, well, that's not going to work. People won't work. No, it works. He has lowest turnover than anybody else in, in Spain. And uh, mainly because I think there's a sense of, of their, he's helping one another, the sense of community. But if you build a town instead of a workers' co-op, you really got a sense of community. I think my system of synergistic capitalism is going to be much better, or will be, or actually is better than Mondragon. And by the way, you can go to Amazon.com and, and buy a, one, of, one of these books, order one of these books, Synergistic Capitalism by Stuart Gordon. <laughs> End of a commercial. I've written nine books, art book, and I've written uh, four books on skiing, and I wrote a book on city planning, and a book on economics, and then I wrote a couple books on spiritualism. After, the, after World War II, my wife and I looked around for a church that we wanted to go to, and we ended up going to a, a, a Unitarian church in Minneapolis. Now, this Unitarian church was really interesting. In fact, the, the minister... Uh, but it was so interesting that my wife and I would, would take notes of the, of the sermons, just like we did in college, taking notes of, of classes we w went to. But the, the, this church did not believe in anything spiritual. And so they, and they said that if there is such a thing as an ex outside world out there, well, good. But we, why not look at Jesus as being a real person who became quite enlightened and then we emulate him and try to live a life like he led. Uh, and and not, let's not one of those hocus pocus stuff, see. So maybe about this couple of years after we joined, I thought, Boot, your life was saved four times during World War II by a voice. And if you hadn't listened to that voice, you wouldn't be here and your kids wouldn't be here. And so uh, there must be another world out there. I think most people have what they call monkey chatter. Blah, blah, blah. I got what's happening for dinner. Who's, who's we gonna call? Oh, I gotta make a phone call. I gotta let's do a little. All this chatter in your subconscious mind running around. See, well, as a fighter pilot, I had to fly formation. I had to look at my instruments to see that they were in green and not in the red. And I had to uh, look for Japanese airplanes. So I had to concentrate on those things. I couldn't think about what's for dinner, my girlfriend, or anything. I had to concentrate. So I was able to do that very easily. I could close, I could close my eyes and I could blank my mind very easily. So, uh, and then of course, once you do that, then you can go into your source, which is in your heart, not in your mind, is into your heart. And so I started reading about the people who are, were quite famous in the field of consciousness. And one was a man by the name of David Hawkins. He was a psychiatrist. He said the most important, maybe the biggest, the largest objection, the largest obstacle to enlightenment is the ego, see? And he said, your ego is important, but you must control your ego, not vice versa. He, he created a map or, or chart of consciousness, that as you go along, and you become more awake and more awake and more awake, and zoom, pretty soon you're going almost straight up. At 200, below 200, 
you did not want to do, you don't want anything to do with people below 200 on the scale of consciousness. They are in darkness. They could kill you and couldn't care less. They wouldn't give a boot, see, about you. They don't care about the world. They don't care, anyway, all they care about is, anyway. And so then you have between 200 you go up to 300, then 400 to 499, that's the area of the ego. This is where the great men of like Einstein and so forth were. And they never got really very high above, never got into 500 because 500 is where they, you become mainly enlightened, mainly uh, uh, loving, more thoughtful than you are in darkness. And then of course you go up to 1000, and that's where Jesus is, and Buddha and Krishna were, see, if there's a thousand. So a thousand is maybe is the highest we could go. And he said that as you go, become more enlightened, you become more law-abiding, you become more prosperous, you become healthier and happier. And, and so it's, why aren't people more interested in this? But usually it's the ego is, is keeping them in and, and fear. Hawkins said that we, as we grow in consciousness, and we are growing in consciousness, and that's a big thing right now. This book is called The Science of the Soul, The Afterlife, and the Shift, by uh, uh, Claude Swanson, who is M uh, studied at MIT in Princeton. And he said that the shift is taking place now. The world is now going to become more loving and more thoughtful and more, and we, we, we say, well, how can that be with well, all these people shooting each other? And, and so, well, that's because the people of low consciousness who control about everything, see, they're in control and they want to divide us and they don't want it, us to become enlightened. They're trying to prevent us from becoming enlightened because what happens when they become enlightened? We become enlightened, they're gone, they're out of here, see? And for thousands of years, millions of years maybe, they'll be in prehistoric, you know, lifetime after lifetime as a caveman. Can you imagine knowing what you know today and being a caveman? Now that's hell, see? <laughs> anyway, so we are rising in consciousness and I'm, and and this very optimistic. Yeah. What what advice do I have, or what do, oh, the big important thing? And this Hawkins, uh, and and also uh, Swanson said the same thing. And they all say, awaken, do everything you can to become more thoughtful, more loving, more appreciative, more helpful of other people, and more forgiving, and and don't be negative. Remember in World War II, we used to have this song, you got to accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, latch on to the affirmative, don't mess with Mr. in between. <laughs> in other words, let's be positive. Let's awaken and be loving and be thoughtful and creative and forgive those people. You can't fight them for every action. There's an opposite reaction. That's Newton's third law of physics. Why do we keep fighting them? Just forgive them and, and realize that they're going to be gone soon. They won't be here. And the more we can create a life of, of love and thoughtfulness and godliness, of, our thoughts are godly, using words that are godly, and creating buildings and worlds and things that are godly that lift mankind, that's what we have to do.